two on here. Check on, check on one of the two cameras. I thought one of them was two. Let me do some talking. Let me just, just leave it as it is right now, okay? Yeah, just, just, just leave it the way it is and we'll go from here with it, okay? All right. Thanks. Two. 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 Okay. Okay. I hope you can hear how far out is that one from this one. I don't know. I did tell you. Okay. If I think everyone's mic is muted right now, I'm hoping that you can hear me. Just use your chat. Okay, if, all right, so now we're, I'm, I'm seeing some replies that you can hear. Okay, wonderful. We just have to test this out, get these kinks out to, so we can uh, uh, make this as beneficial for you as possible. So I'm sorry about these technical difficulties this morning. So we're going to continue. And what I was saying was just to remember that teachers understand that student growth is uh, one of the sources of evidence for the teacher effectiveness system. Okay, so let's think a little bit about the process, the student growth goal process. Okay, first the teacher must identify the enduring learning by standards for the grade level and subject area they teach. So once that is identified, then they have to determine what are the assessment processes and plans uh, that need to be in place to measure this. After that, they establish a baseline. This is what should be happening right now in your schools. Uh, teachers are assessing where students are at Hopefully, they have begun identifying some of those enduring learnings uh, that students might be having difficulty with that they might want to write their student growth goal around. Then they establish that baseline. After that, they determine an appropriate student growth goal. And in that goal, it has to have a growth and proficiency statement. And we're going to look at all this as we go through this morning. And then throughout the year, just monitor progress and adjust your teaching strategies throughout the year. Just remember, the goal does not change throughout the year. The goal stays the same, but you can adjust your teaching strategies as needed. And remember, it is one goal for one group of students. Okay, and then at the end of the year, you're going to use those district determined rules to rate overall student growth as either low, expected, or high. Okay, and I'm seeing that, yes, you can get this PowerPoint after the presentation. What I would ask you to do is if you want a copy of it, if you'll just email me, and then I can send it directly to you. That would, that would be easier for me, okay? All right, so for goal setting, identifying enduring skills. So you need to think about this question. Do the enduring skills you identified meet the definition of enduring and tie directly to the standards? I think, you know, at last year, this enduring learning was something new, okay? So hopefully we have a little bit better understanding this year about enduring learning and realize that that comes directly from the standards. Okay, so when a teacher chooses their enduring learning from their standards, they need to make sure that it meets these guidelines, okay, or as many of them as possible. Okay, so it is learning that endures beyond a single test date. It has value in other disciplines. It's relevant beyond the classroom. Okay, it's something that is going to be used all throughout the course, all throughout the year. It may be necessary for the next level of instruction, and it does require that critical thinking piece. And you want to remember that and enduring learning is not just a sub-skill, 
Okay, so I could give you an example of like a main idea that would not be an enduring learning because main idea would fall under summarization or summarizing. So that would be the enduring learning. So just remember it is not a sub-skill. Okay, it's not just an activity that you do with students. Okay, and it's not just a strategy. Okay, so just make sure when a teacher chooses their enduring learning that they look at this definition and they make sure that it does apply. Okay, so the basics of a student growth goal, you know that it must be a SMART goal. That means it is specific, measurable, appropriate, realistic, and time-bound. And we will take a look at those in just a few minutes. I've already stated it has to have a proficiency component and a growth component. Okay, so the proficiency component, you know, is that percentage. Okay, the percentage of students that will reach proficiency on that enduring learning that you are measuring, and then a growth statement. And you'll notice that in your student growth goals, you really will say that all students will grow because all students should grow if you're working with them uh, throughout the year. And so you have to determine how, that, how much growth uh, it would be acceptable for your goal. And then once again, it is for one classroom of students in one uh, content area. Okay, so now remember, I'm going to throw this in about the OPGES. Okay, so they may not write their goal for an entire class and it's not going to be for the entire school, but it's going to be for a group of students that they have, that they are working with or that they have impact with. Okay, so just know that uh, it, it could look a little different for OPGES, but the process is the same. Okay, so the student growth goal should be SMART. Specific, measurable, appropriate, realistic, and time-bound. So specific means it is focused on a specific area of need, okay? So when a teacher is trying to decide upon their student growth goal, what is that enduring learning that their students need to work on, then they need to be going directly to their standards, standards that they teach by, okay? So make sure that's what makes it specific then it must be measurable and you need an appropriate uh, instrument to actually measure that. So here are some questions to kind of think about as far as making it measurable. Think about how your school already collects data and then what you could use to measure student growth for that enduring skill that you've identified. Okay, And just make sure that you have multiple measures of assessments throughout the year. Okay. And as far as measuring, uh, best practice would be to develop a rubric uh, to measure your student growth goal and then you would have these multiple assessments throughout the year to show where they fall at, where the students fall on the rubric as you move throughout the school year. Then we move to appropriate. And so for it to be appropriate, does it match the standards that you teach, that you work with for those students? Okay, so just remember, um, regular teachers are going to go to their core content standards, OPGES. They have their own standards that they are going to uh, be focused on for their student growth goals. And then when you get to the R, it's realistic, but I always like to think about it as realistic and rigorous because you want the goal to be achievable, you want it to be realistic, but you want it to be rigorous. You want it to stretch those students just as far as they can be stretched throughout the year. And, you know, and think about when you set your growth and your proficiency targets, you really want to think about is that realistic. So if you'll take a look at that example there, you know, if your baseline data shows that only 20% of the students are proficient in the identified skill, would it be realistic to say that 90% of them are going to reach proficient at the end of the year or when that goal is measured? All right. To me, that does not sound realistic. 
Okay, so just make sure that you focus on your baseline data. Focus on that trend data at the beginning of the year. Where are the students at at the beginning of the year? And then make a realistic goal around that. And then the goal also needs to be time bound. Okay, uh, and that can be an entire school year, it can be a semester, it can be six weeks, nine weeks, it really just depends on the teacher schedule and how they actually work with students throughout the year. So you want to make sure that it is time bound. So that can be different for your regular classroom teachers as opposed to your OPGES teachers. Uh, theirs may look somewhat different on the time bound piece. Okay, so we always have a lot of questions around, well, how do we actually know, you know, what number we need to use for proficient? And when we started this process over the past few years, uh, all the samples that came out had 80%, and everyone thought that in their student growth goal, they had to write 80% proficient, that that was the correct number. There's not a perfect number. Okay, so here is just a formula that several people in our region have been using just to help give them a little guidance uh, in trying to uh, determine uh, the proficiency number for their student growth goal. So if you take a look at that, what you're going to do is you take a look at your students, the number of students that are already proficient on the enduring skill. Okay, sometimes you'll have some students one or two that might already be at the proficient stage or even a little higher. And then you add that uh, to the number of students that are close to making proficiency already. They're close, but they're not there yet. And then you also add that to those students that they might not be real close at the moment to reaching proficiency, but you've worked with them here at the beginning of the year and you see the potential that they have and you know that working with them, you are almost definite that you'll be able to get them to proficient um, by the end of the year. So you add all of those up and you divide it by the total number of students. And then that's going to give you a percentage. And I'm not saying that definitely use that percentage, but you can use this to help you think about uh, those students that uh, can make proficiency. So in that formula, you'll notice that uh, we didn't count the students that are not likely to reach proficiency. And we all know, let's be realistic, we all know that in our classrooms, we sometimes get students that um, are way below grade level, okay, and it's not realistic from where they are at that they're going to be able to reach proficiency. So what's going to happen is you don't, you just don't consider them in this formula because you don't think they're going to reach proficiency. And so that way you've kind of allowed for those students. So I'm not saying definitely use the exact percentage here, but this just gives you something to kind of play around with as you are working on uh, your proficiency number for your student growth goal. Okay, so let's take a look at a goal here. And this one actually is a fourth grade goal. But what I want to stress to you, uh, I always have participants, they'll say, well, we need high school samples, we need middle school samples, we need elementary samples. You know, every student growth goal is going to be different because the group of students you have in your classes are different. So don't look so much at what grade level it is, but look at uh, how it is written and how it is laid out. Okay, so if you put your principal hat on at this point and you looked at this goal, you would want to consider is it a SMART goal and does it have a growth statement and does it have a proficiency statement? Okay, so you can see there in red, it is summarizing key ideas, key ideas and details. That is the enduring skill, the growth target, students will improve two or more levels on that rubric, and then the proficiency target is 70% of 
of students will score proficient. Now, as a principal, I would look at that and I would have some questions to ask the teacher about that. First of all, you know, where, where did you pull that enduring learning from? Where did you get that? So you want to you wanna make sure that teachers realize that their enduring learning needs to come from their standards and they need to be able to show you in their standards uh, where they pulled that and have some rationale behind uh, that enduring learning. Then each student will improve two or more levels on the rubric. How do I know if that is realistic for your students? So number one, you would need to see the rubric. So teachers need to provide that for you. Uh, have some discussion around how those rubrics were developed. Were they developed uh, together as a team or pulled off the internet? You know, I always say use what you have, use the resources you have, but just remember that a lot of times you have to, you have to make those types of things meet your needs because all the students are going to be different, okay? So we might have several uh, grades or teachers that are focusing on summarizing key ideas and details as they're enduring learning, but their goal will look different because of the growth and the proficiency because all the students are going to be at a different point, okay? So, and then as far as proficient, what baseline data did you base that on? You know, and teachers should be able to share that data and uh, talk through this process uh, with the administrator. All right, so uh, the next few slides we are not going to go in depth on, but these are really good resources for principals to use in guiding the discussion for approving student growth goals, but not only approving them, but then scoring them at the end. But I think it's also important that you provide this uh, to teachers because it's a, it helps guide them through the process as well. So, you know, you look at the questions, how did you select the enduring learning? And there are things to look for and next steps uh, to provide. And you'll notice in there that we've also addressed the OPGES, you know, where their enduring learnings should be coming from as well. Then as we move forward, you know, what are the standards that support the identified enduring learning? How did you determine baseline data? And how did you determine proficiency and really that uh, pathway to proficiency? And how did you develop that rubric? So these are some really good resources that I think that you would want to pull out and use with your teachers. How did you determine the amount of expected growth? And you know, what assessments are you going to use throughout the year to monitor? And then the last one on that section is questions to guide scoring. So then when you get to the end of the year, you have to score this. So here are some questions that can guide some uh, conversations with teachers around uh, scoring that student growth goal that they've been measuring all throughout the year. Okay, so before we move on, does anyone have any uh, questions about what we've already looked at this morning? If you do, you can just uh, chat those in. And I have someone in here with me kind of monitoring that. So if she sees questions, we will, uh, we will address those. Ask questions all along the way today if you have any, please. All right, so we're going to look at a sample process now. And the reason I want to do this is for many teachers and even administrators, it's hard to see the big picture. You know, everybody's so focused on we have to get a goal written and it has to be written, you know, within the next few weeks. And so, but we really need to understand the process, okay? We should be moving past just compliant I have to write a goal to really understanding what the goal is and how to monitor it throughout the year and how to make this process beneficial for the teachers and for the students. 
Okay, so we know the first thing we have to do is identify that enduring understanding. So I want to give you an example of how a teacher can do that. Number one, they have to be in their standards. Okay, so they're going to pull out their standards. So this was a third grade uh, group of teachers that were working on this actual student growth goal. So they went right to their standards. And for this particular teacher, the focus in that school was on math. So they knew that they were going to write their uh, math goal, make that their student growth goal because that was the area that everyone was weaker in. So they went directly to their standards. And you can see there, you know, at the arrow, at the introduction, when they went to the introduction, then under that, they would find all these critical areas for math for third grade. Those critical areas are your enduring learnings. Okay, so I know teachers have struggled with what are enduring learnings. They come directly from your standards. And when you choose one, you just need to go back to that definition of enduring and make sure that it meets those guidelines. But the critical areas in math can be used as enduring learning. And this teacher actually uh, chose uh, critical area number one about understanding of multiplication and division. Okay, from there, then you had to think about uh, what are the other standards that go right underneath that enduring learning? Okay, so what are other third grade standards that have to be met, okay, to meet that enduring learning or to be proficient? So they started going down through and looking at all of the different strands, and they started bundling standards together, okay? They started bundling together and pulling out the ones that, yes, this goes along with understanding multiplication and division. Okay, so from there, you kind of see, you'll see this graphic organizer, this chart. Uh, now, this is not something that you have to do. This is something that these teachers were already doing. They were already uh, tracking students on particular standards uh, throughout the year, but they hadn't really been bundling them together like under an overall enduring learning. So that's what they did here. Okay, and you can see that they pulled out, okay, from the third grade standards, you can see 7, 3, MD, 7, A, B, and all the way across. Okay, those were the third grade standards that they felt like uh, students had to master according to that enduring learning. So then what did they do? They started assessing their students here at the beginning of the year. That's their baseline data, assessing students on how they are performing uh, on all of these standards. And you can see that red means, you know, they have no idea about the standard, okay? Yellow, they have some understanding of the standard. And then green, they've really mastered that standard already. But as they went through this process, they realized that um, they were not sure where to actually start still. So then what they did is they went back and they talked to uh, the first grade teachers and the second grade teachers. Okay, So you can look on the left there and you see that they went back to the first and second grade standards and they really pulled out the standards that were important that the students should have mastered to be ready to even start on this understanding of multiplication and division in third grade. And they went ahead and they assessed the students on those standards as well. And when they did that, you can see the yellow uh, and even a few reds showing up there. So they found out that many of their students, or some of their students, had not mastered those first and second grade level standards. So that doesn't mean that they went back and started teaching those standards from first grade and second grade, but they used that information and they used that data uh, for like RTI and reteaching because they knew those students had to master those standards. So that was very good data to use like for their RTI classes.
All right, so take just a moment and think about uh, where you're at in this process of choosing and enduring learning. Okay, how are your teachers doing that right now? Um, are they digging into their standards? Um, how are they assessing? Does anyone have any questions? At this point, if you do, feel free to uh, let me know. Uh, I know we have a question there about an instructional coach example. If you would email me and specifically ask for that, I do think I have maybe one example for an instructional coach. I'm not sure, but I think that I do, and I'd be happy to send that out. Uh, so if you'll shoot me an email, that would be wonderful, and I'll take care of uh, trying to get some examples out. We don't have a lot of examples. I'm going to say that. And one reason, uh, you know, as far as from KDE, we've talked about this, and every goal is going to be different, okay? And a lot of times when we put samples out there, then everybody wants to write their goal just exactly like that sample, which does not always meet the needs of your students. So just be cautious of that when you see samples, uh, just to make sure that, uh, that you need to make sure that you are looking at your students, okay, and choosing an enduring learning that they need to work on throughout the year or throughout that uh, set time that you're working with them. Okay, and I see that next question talking about uh, prior years and student growth goals. Yes, your student growth goal should be written on your standards that you are teaching, okay? So just like third grade, then that growth goal is written with those standards in mind. So yes, you're going to have students that might not have mastered prior years. That's kind of where that rubric comes in as far as measuring that student growth goal from the year because you're going to develop what does proficiency look like? And we're going to be talking about that. But what does proficiency look like? And then on your rubric, as you move back in other levels of your rubric, then you may have to pull from the standards from the previous grade if that's where your students are starting at, at the beginning of the year. And we'll take a look at that. But yes, you write your student growth goal based on the grade level. Uh, that they are in. Okay. All right, so let's now, let's move on to the pathway development here. And you have to think about where your students are at the beginning and then where, where you need them to be at the end of the year, okay? So what these teachers did, and I think was, uh, has been one of the easiest ways to work on a rubric I've had a lot of teachers concerned with, you know, I'm not used to writing rubrics and I don't know what to include on them. And I think this process is an easy way to kind of get started. Okay, so what they did was they looked at all the standards, okay, the third grade standards, and they discussed which standards do students need to master if they're going to be proficient in that enduring learning? And you'll see level four proficiency, they felt like three, OA, five, six, and seven. If they could master those standards and all the ones before them, then that would be proficiency. Okay? So what did they do? Then they went back and they made level three, level two, and level one based on those standards, okay? And most of their students uh, started over here at level one, okay? Then you'll see on the right side that they also uh, had some standards. I think those, I can't see it on my screen, 7C and 7D, which were also third grade standards, but they felt like those went above and beyond. So, they made that the next level on your rubric. And you want to make sure that you always go above proficiency on your rubric. 
because you're always going to have those high-flying students that are already going to be at proficiency or going to get there quickly and they need to be able to show growth throughout the year also. So you can do that like they did here with some additional uh, standards from your grade level or you may need to even go up to the next grade level and look at standards that would go along with the enduring learning. So that's the way that this group uh, did this. All right, so let's look at how they, on their rubric, you have these uh, materials attached to the email that I sent out earlier. Okay, so, but let's take a look. This is the way they did their rubric. Okay, level four was proficient. Okay, so at the top, they put their enduring understanding or their enduring learning that was from critical area one. All right, and then level four was their proficient. And you notice that what they did was they just actually put the standards in there. That's what proficiency was going to look like when they could master those standards. And then they also put it into another format. So I'm going to move forward to the next one. This is the same Okay, this is the same rubric, it's just, it's just laid out a little differently. So they've got the level starting at the bottom, one, and then going up to five. Proficiency stays the same. It is that level four. Okay, that's not going to change throughout the year. And then what they wanted to do was take their baseline data and plug students in right on that rubric. Where are they at? So they knew exactly where students were at and they had the data to back it up at the beginning of the year. And so you see the names of students. And some of them do have plus signs. And that just lets you know that the plus signs uh, mean that, say, let's just take uh, King, for instance, there in level two. She has a plus sign by her name. That just means that she has already mastered some of the level three standards but has not mastered all of them yet, that's the reason her name couldn't be placed in level three. But that just lets you know that they're closer to getting to that next level. So this is one way uh, that you can take care of, of uh, working on a rubric. Okay, so now go back and think about your school again. How do teachers determine their baseline data? You know, what kinds of uh, what kinds of assessments and things are they looking at to determine that? How are they determining what proficiency looks like? Because that's very important. I mean, you write your goal and you have that enduring learning, but teachers need to know exactly what proficiency looks like. Okay, and I will suggest, you know, any of this process that they can do in groups, in PLCs, with other teachers, uh, really makes it more beneficial than doing it just on your own and developing the rubrics. Okay, so just think about uh, any takeaways that you have or any questions. Just send those in if you have those and we'll address them and I'm going to move forward. All right, and then when we fast forward to the end of the year, okay, um, and scoring that goal. You just want to keep up with that assessment piece all the way throughout the year and using multiple types of assessments to really measure where students are at and how they're performing. So you can see this group of students, how they ended the year, where they started their baseline, and how they scored on the rubric at the end of the year. And you can see grade in the ones that met proficiency and then the ones that met their growth. Okay, so this is just exactly what you will do with your student growth goals as you go throughout the year. And you will see that 54% met proficiency and 86% grew two or more levels. So if we take a look, okay, there's the goal. Okay, and the teacher said all students will grow at least two levels on the rubric and 70% of students will reach proficiency. So you can look at the data over there, 86% of those students grew two or more levels and then 54% met proficiency. So then you have to think about how did that teacher score 
on their student growth goal at the end of the year, low, expected, or high. And to make that connection, you will want to check your district CEP. This is just one sample of how uh, to measure a student growth goal. But by looking at this, you can see that this teacher had low growth. high growth and low proficiency, which means that they were expected. Okay, so that's just how it's measured at the end of the year, and that depends on uh, what your matrices look like in your certified evaluation plan. Okay, so let's just take a little bit of time here and see what questions, what do you need now as far as student growth is concerned? What, what are your needs at this point uh, with student growth and working with your teachers uh, here at the beginning of the year? And I know everyone is working on student growth. So what are the tools besides some samples that you still need uh, to help your teachers uh, and administrators work through this process? And I, I would appreciate, you know, any comments that, uh, you know, you want to give there because as we continue with this process of doing some of these online trainings, uh, we want to make, uh, we want to value your time and we want to give you things that are timely and needed in your buildings. And so, thinking about our next steps. And like I said, if you would like this PowerPoint and you would just send me an email, that would be the easiest way for me to send out uh, the copy of this PowerPoint. Feel free to use it along with the uh, recorded session uh, with your teachers. And then if you need additional support, you can always contact me. That's what I'm here for. I've been out in a lot of schools uh, working on student growth goals and, and just this process and trying to gain a deeper understanding of it. All right, so we are close to the end today, so I want to take just a few minutes and think about um, some plus and deltas. All right, so as far as this meeting today, does this meet your needs? Would you like us to continue uh, this process? And if so, you know, once again, what are some uh, topics that you would like us to cover? Uh, as far as I'm thinking mostly just PGES, but uh, anything around peer observation or continuation of student growth goals or rubric designs or any anything that your teachers uh, need help with, maybe we can provide that in this format. So we would like some feedback. So I'm going to give you just a second and would love to hear some feedback, see some feedback about this process. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, really any comments coming back, but Feel free to email me if you have additional questions or comments. 
about this process or things that you would like to see, I would be really grateful to have some feedback about that. So just kind of summarizing where we're at in this process. Right now, your teachers should be choosing their enduring learning. They should be working on uh, collecting baseline data uh, to determine exactly where their students are right now. They can draft those student growth goals uh, and begin uh, developing their rubrics to measure them. So if you need assistance with any of those things, feel free to let me know. I do apologize for our technical difficulties at the beginning of our, of our session today, uh, but we knew we would probably have some just because this is a new process for us and we're trying out several uh, avenues for this. So if no one has anything else, we will just go ahead and uh, end our session, but I'm still going to be here. I know your time is, is very valuable, and I know some of you need to get back to uh, more pressing issues, but I will be here uh, for the next few minutes. If anyone has additional questions, uh, feel free to uh, chat those or go ahead and turn your mic on, and we can talk something out if you need to do that. So thank you for joining us today, and just remember that uh, this has been recorded, and it will be uh, accessed at the GREC YouTube link that I sent in the previous email, and that should be that it will be there by Friday, hopefully by tomorrow. That is tomorrow. Yes. Sorry, that is tomorrow. It will be there by tomorrow. We'll hopefully get it there by this afternoon. So if you want to use that with teacher, then feel free to do that. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the next time we can get together and and have some time. Uh, to do some professional learning. Thanks and have a great afternoon.